Hello, today is March 29th. This is the KCP community call. Uh, up on screen, we have our issue for the agenda for today. And if you are interested in adding some agenda items, please feel free to add comments to the bottom of the issue. I just put the link in the meeting chat, so you have a, an easy link to that. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started with the first one, which, uh, Jason, you've got. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I hope that this doesn't turn into a, a, a long uh, debate or discussion or whatever. But in so issue 774, or PR 774 was adding the demo script for uh, cluster Cordon and Evict. Uh, and Maru pointed out that this is, is pretty similar. I mean, I realized it too, but uh, it's pretty similar to the existing, you know, end to end tests we have that prove that you can create a cluster. Uh, stuff schedules to it, you coordinate, no new stuff schedules to it, you evict, everything leaves, you know, like like the, the mechanics of that are pretty simple. Um, but now we have it in Go end to end tests and we have it in Bash Magic uh, 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 demo script. And uh, I don't know, he's, yeah, I guess he's here, but I will, I will poorly summarize, like, why do we have two of these? Uh, and Paul's answer was, I think we should, discuss. Uh, this might actually tie into the next item too about prototype versus Ember, but uh, I, I don't, you know, I've already written it, so I don't personally mind having two copies of it, so long as only one of them is canonical for breaking CI, uh, and that's the end-to-end -end test, like the, the Go test. Um, I'm also fine not having Bash Magic, the, the Bash Magic version in the repo if we think that's not providing value or uh, only, you know, I'll create it and then I'll record it and then I will delete it or it'll live in a directory in the repo that slowly routes over time until, you know, whatever. I don't know. I, I mostly brought it up because uh, uh, it seemed like a useful discussion for future prototypes and demos. Um, I was curious what other folks thought. Yeah, we had talked about this a few meetings ago about if it was valuable to continue maintaining the demos and making sure that they function as the code in the repo evolves, or if we wanted to treat them as point in time and not maintain them, or if we wanted to just not have demos in the repo at all and instead have uh, documentation that explains the functionality with the expectation that we would keep the docs up to date. And I don't think that we necessarily came to any conclusion for which approach we wanted to take. So um, does anybody have any thoughts or comments on the topic? Not seeing anybody on mute. <laughs> um, I mean, I th yeah, I think like if they're not this was brought up before, but if yeah. the demo scripts are not uh, exercised in any way after they're committed, they will break. They might have already broken. Like this, this the script might have already broken since you know Friday. So uh, I mean, we could we could not put them in the repo and just make it some person's responsibility to record a demo for what seems worth demoing put it up on YouTube or ASCII Cinema, maybe link to it from the repo somewhere, but not worry about, uh, you know, committing it. That, that could be one option. Yeah, we're, we're in future, uh, because like the demo script uh, is part of each uh, work item in each prototype. It is at the end, like, and show a demo that it works. But we could just re rephrase those from commit a demo a demo magic bash script to uh, record a video or record an ASCII cinema or, or something. Yeah, Stefan. Yeah, two other ideas: a second repository under KCP Dev where it's clear what the purpose is and the guarantees, like Contrib or I don't know something like that, mm -hmm. and. I personally would prefer a markdown blog post-like presentation of a feature 
-hmm. Maybe with the ASCII cinema as well, but more like this style than just a, a video, video, uh, 10 minutes of video showing that who will follow that actually. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't even have to be a video necessarily. Like if it's a blog post with some screenshots or some code snippets yeah. or both, that could work. Plus, um, plus a link here is a script. It works with this uh, version of KCP. And... Yeah. I, I find these better. I, I hate video. It's, it's so slow and, and sometimes too fast and, and sometimes too slow. Um, Go ahead, Fabian. Um, we have prototype specific branches too, don't we? That aren't going to be uh, updated as we move to the next one. So we could also commit the prototype specific demos to those branches only and not have them in main. Yeah. And link to, link to the markdown basically into the branch could be possible in GitHub. Uh, so I think. An action item here might be to summarize the different options and then have some async discussion if there's any more that people want to have and then decide a path to go forward with. Sounds good. Um, Jason, would you be willing to yeah, take yeah, that yeah. on? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I thought uh, I was assuming that was the case, but yeah, let's be explicit. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, all right, moving on to the next topic, which is mine about prototype number versus semantic versioning. Uh, I wonder if it's maybe a little confusing to outside observers coming into KCP to see that we have prototype version or prototype numbers instead of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so on. And I would, uh, it, I will second what Stefan just wrote in chat that uh, it would be my preference to start using semantic versions all pre 1.0 so everything is subject to breakage uh, but I think that'll be less confusing to the outward community and outside observers so my suggestion uh, which is certainly up for debate is to move to Semver for uh, going forward. Anybody have any thoughts? I'm a strong plus one on that. I think the, the idea that we're going to be pushing out releases to the shared service and we just have this big, huge granular milestone, that doesn't make sense. We need something more granular. And I see Gorkum wrote, for me, prototypes also represented a date. Uh, we're not necessarily removing dates from Semver uh, mm -hmm. milestones in GitHub. It's just changing the name right. from prototype N to 0 0.3 or whatever. Yeah, I, I was actually just going to say that. It's like for me, separating the prototype, which is uh, attached to a date to from the version number makes a lot of sense. That's what I was going to say. I was trying to type. <laughs> and did you imagine we're adding a bunch of Git tags to the repo or? This would include doing Git tagging when we cut a a, a pre-release version. Yeah. And Stefan has a pull request open to set the LD flags for version string information. Um, so this would be able to take advantage of that as well. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any, any objections, so I will happily take on the action item of renaming the milestones, and uh, I'll send an email to the dev list as well. Okay, uh, Jason, you have the next topic. Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned it before, but the CFP for KubeCon North America in Detroit is open. I think we're doing a ton of really interesting, novel, exciting work. And uh, if you don't come to these meetings, you probably don't know about it. So I would like to lobby at least a few of us to think about what 
talks we could propose. I'm more than happy to help you uh, write the abstract, help you write the proposals, more than happy to talk about co-presenting if uh, it's something I think I could possibly co-present with. Uh, but uh, I think we're doing a lot of cool stuff and this would be a really good opportunity to go into more detail with folks about what we're doing and, and you know, brag on our, our progress a little better. Um, I have, there are some possible things I think could be worth uh, uh, mining for talks listed there. If you have other stuff, uh, you know, by all means, but I think we're doing a lot of cool stuff and we should be talking to more folks about it. Very cool. Um, so folks, if you are interested in working on those topics or have other topics, please let Jason and the rest of us know. Okay, David, over to you for your topic. Uh, thank you. So let me share my second screen. Yes, last week I showcased uh, mainly um, the new approach for the Sinker, which would be to use uh, Sinker virtual workspace. You see my screen correctly? Yes. Um, mainly just for the reminder, it consists in this. Um, I have, um, uh, in fact, um, a subpath, an endpoint dedicated to each sinker. So here, the sinker that lives in the US West kind cluster uh, that has been registered in the default demo uh, uh, KCP workspace. And then I have, in fact, one endpoint for each sinker. And the sinker would point to this, um, and it would be the sinker view of the KCP world, let's say it like that. Uh, so if I do AP, API resources on such a, uh, an endpoint, I get only, um, of course, internal uh, <coughs> sorry internal types, and then the deployments, because only deployment API has been negotiated between this kind cluster and, and KCP. So uh, just for the reminder, uh, so the, the 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 addition based on on um, last week work is um, exploration to implement the you know the syncing strategy typically the in my case the deployment splitter having a distinct view a slightly changed view of uh, the same deployment for each sinker you know a six replica on one side seven replica on the other side and then be ab being able to consolidate the status back to the um, external uh, visible kcp deployment how we did that previously, we mainly just create two deployments, leaf deployments, explicitly in the KCP world. And instead of that, we can just on the fly, directly um, in each of these virtual workspaces, change the view that each sinker has uh, to change the number of, replic of, re of uh, expected replicas. And then also on the other way around, when a sinker would update its replicas, on the fly, we would be able to update uh, the, the, the main KCP replicas by just uh, summar, uh, summarizing, summing, in fact, the replicas of all the locations. Uh, so to showcase that, I have a, a KCP running. Let me just show you here also. Clear, it would be better now. Yeah, so to start the sinker, here it's just you know uh, external sinker, so I'm not in pull or push mode in KCP. I just start it externally, and I point here. Sorry, it seems now. Oh wow, well, I have it. That's it now. Yes. So as you can see, I point here to um, KCP. Uh, is the with the cube config, but I override the server here to point to uh, the virtual sinker virtual workspace for this location for the location of the us west one cluster and the same for the other sinker so each sinker is really pointing to a cluster which is its dedicated virtual workspace let me start it here the other one is already started for the east one <coughs> um, location now if i create the a deployment. So here is the deployment I will create is the one used in, in other demos. Obviously, I changed the labels here because 
currently the cluster label is mainly you know oriented to the one-to-one -one thinking use case you you can have only one cluster label that points to a given location and here what i want to do is split between two locations so that's why i just we wrote the labels a bit differently, cluster dot and the name of the location here. So, and the virtual thinker, the virtual, the thinker virtual workspace, sorry, will be able to directly transfer one, this deployment to uh, East One location, East One thinker, showing exactly what East One should see and would forward uh, this to the West One uh, thinker, just also presenting what West One should see. So if I apply uh, the deployment now, and now I do get deployments, I can see that I have exactly the same mechanic, the same behavior as the deployment splitter, but without a deployment splitter. In fact, I mean without addition, additional deployments, everything is stored on the single deployment, which is the KCP one. So obviously, the question is where is the where are the location specific statuses replicas stored and um, if we look in in more details here we can see that they are stored in that's something we had discussed in the past they're stored in annotations which are typically internal annotations that only the thinker is interested in and only the virtual thinker of course <clears throat> and these are uh, just the diffs between the main KCP object and each location diff for the, both the spec and the status. Uh, so that means that really only the main deployment contains the whole information, its status, own status, the externally visible and spec, and then the diffs that allows you reconstructing the corresponding view for each location based on the main KCP object. And on the other hand, um, if I try to have a look to what is the view that the West One thinker uh, has on, on these deployments, here you can see that the West only sees seven available replicas. Well, not, well, that's the status, but if you look in the spec, uh, the West only gets seven replicas. But also, um, on the fly during you know transformations that are on the fly applied by the thinker virtual workspace uh, it gets the um, diff on the other way around the way to rebuild um, the kcp the main kcp object from this location so location can know what the uh, main kcp object is and the other way around and managing that uh, round trip uh, correctly i mean in round trip allows um, um, iteratively um, adding both, I mean, consolidating the status uh, of the main KCP object by, based on the the, uh, the status of each location. Because in fact, always the main KCP object has all the information regarding all the locations um, that are um, associated to it for each thinker. So uh, just for, for the fun here, if I change, not not here, sorry. Here, if I just do a patch and try to scale up to uh, 51, and then you know, get the deployments, then we can see that it's slowly um, increasing. And if also I try to directly look into the kind cluster, the west one, here I can see that now uh, it it was increased. So, I mean, everything here, I mean, the, the external behavior is exactly the same as the existing deployment splitter, but you just don't have um, additional deployments, uh, one for each location. Another point which is quite important is that in such a model, um, you, the sinker becomes even more, uh, you know, systematic and blind. The sinker even doesn't have to you know, even use a label to get everything that is labeled for it, because this filtering would also be done on the virtual workspace uh, for each endpoint, in fact, for each um, uh, thinker. And also, 
here everything is done due, due to this round trip management of diffs uh, annotations. Um, everything is done completely synchronously. It's just based on transformations that are done on the virtual workspace side, which I showed uh, last week, um, that are really synchronous when just done just before um, transferring the request uh, to the KCP shard, in fact. So, yeah, that's mainly uh, so how it works for the, the deployment splitter. And I'm currently working also on testing that uh, on, the, on the other main use case, which is the ingress splitter. Because clearly here, um, the, the syncing, in fact, is really just implementing in, in the code, in the Go code uh, of the virtual syncer, implementing a sync strategy, which means the, just exactly the logic that you have in the deployment splitter. Uh, you have a location, you have a new KCP resource that has been changed on the KCP side. You want to produce the corresponding location view, the corresponding view for a given sinker. Based on this, typically you would, you know, divide the number of expected replicas by the number of locations. And, and for the update from location, it's the contrary. You get the new uh, location specific view of the object uh, with the status changed, updated. And then it would, due to the diffs, it would be able to reconstruct the main KCP object. And based on this, to get the other locations and based on the uh, status of each location, be able to reconstruct um, the status of the main object. So that's the whole point is really that uh, all the information is contained into these annotations, which also makes it possible for more complex cases like in the ingress, uh, uh, you know, and for ingress controller, that it could be done um, out process. In the case of the deployment splitter, it's just in process. I just mainly took the, the logic of the deployment splitter and, and pushed that into the, the, those two methods. But it can be done also out process. Typically, you can have a, a controller. I mean, th this, this implementation would mainly just do nothing. But in any case, you would have all those diffs uh, annotation um, up to date, which means that any controller can look at the main KCP object, get an you know um, a, a helper that that is in the code that would be in the code to reconstruct uh, each location specific object, and then then based on this uh, would apply the logic that uh, it would would like to apply. So that's how obviously we we would do for the ingress uh, splitter, and so. In fact, the ingress splitter would just react each time an ingress is changed and the annotations are changed. Let's rebuild all the, look, the, the view for each location. And then, of course, get the updated status for each location. And based on those status, update the Envoy um, uh, controller. Yeah, so that's mainly how, I mean, a, a proposal that, that I'm about to, to try to formalize and, and write. And that we can you know, start discussion based on this. Yeah, go ahead, Stefan. Yeah, I would like to see some Google Doc exploring that, writing down so rules and so yeah. on. <laughs> sure, also, I'm, very, I'm very curious how this can be extended to facets eventually. Whether facets will replace that or just a different view of the same thing. Doesn't have to be answered here. It's something for the Google Doc just to explore and sketch it. Yes, exactly. Typically, here, uh, if we have a look to the uh, the strategy implementation for um, for um, the, that I plugged to to the deployments, um, in fact, it's a strategy that is really for all the scalable objects because um, if everything every, it's exactly the same logic as what exists in the deployment splitter but based on unstructured object. So mainly as soon as I have, you know, spec replicas and status replicas. So what is expected from a scalable object, the same strategy can be applied to all the GVRs that satisfy this, um, this structure. So it seems that, and that would be probably the same for other type of strategies. That would be common to, to a number of, of objects having all the same behavior. Does it sort of answer your question or? 
No, I'm, I'm not sure. We can talk offline about that. Sure. Um, I just want to, I mean, if we use annotations now, I mean, they, they grow bigger, right? This, this use of diffs is clever. Maybe it's even a good solution, but maybe in the future we want to have something that users can understand. Like this is nothing for users at the moment, right? That's a diff for, for controllers or for this virtual workspace. Yeah, that, I mean, that's um, mainly, there are several aspects there. It's the, the annotations here are mainly the storage part of it. Somewhere you have to, 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 to know where you're going to store the, the diffs between the main object and each locations. Here I store that in annotations. So obviously I had to, you know, enable updating annotations at the same time as the status in the CUD handler. Yeah. just for internal annotations but we could obviously choose to uh, store that somewhere else or in some other you know you know dedicated field that would be added or you know anything else yeah we we can do some brainstorm, brainstorming session about this i think i have some ideas how we could use that maybe hide it in the future so we should talk about that if we start like that, it's fine, um, but we need a way forward when we want to get rid of this ugliness eventually. Yes, surely. I mean, that's really implementation detail, but just to explain, uh, just a way to, to, to showcase the fact that we can finally have a way to uh, store all these divs and information really attached to a single object. Um, to answer Steve's question, there's a big yes. Um, we can, I mean, this is just a URL, right? Um, yes. Pointing your kubectl to this URL with the right permissions, a user could see what the sinker sees. So that's and that exactly, was what David showed earlier. Uh, yes, that's this one. If I, uh, sorry, not this one. Yes, this one. If I do kubectl and I override the server here to point to um, the virtual, uh, the the virtual workspace endpoint dedicated to this sinker, then I can see exactly what, what this, the corresponding sinker would see. So obviously here it would have, yes, 26 replicas. And, and here also I get the status that was previously updated from this sinker. So it's really the, completely the view that the sinker views from, from the KCP world. And we could have a way by as a plugin to switch to a view for one cluster, right? Yes, yes, completely. I mean, it's just simple. a question. Of, once again, it's just a question of the the URL uh, where yeah. you the, where you point, and you expect the cluster to to answer. In the 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 cube API server, I mean. That was really cool, yeah. David. I'm definitely looking forward to the Google Doc. Uh, <laughs> sure. And checking out the code too. So thanks for the demo and the explanation. Maybe just one thing which I found um, surprising, but in a good way. Um, all of this stuff is really real time, right? It's not about this, that there's an informal warning in the virtual API server. It's, no, it's on the, in the request. When you do the request, the sync does request. Yes, exactly. This transformation and happens. Yeah, which, so it's completely which, real time. I mean, on the fly. And the other thing so is that, sorry, sorry, it's yeah. stateless, right? That's that's the point. It's stateless. It's a stateless yes, transformation. Completely. Yeah. And also the fact that um, you know this round trip diff mechanism, that um, on the fly when when a location um, retrieves you know its view, it gets the the diff added. Uh, the other way around. I mean, the diff between the location and the KCP and the main KCP object. This allows round tripping that so that when you update the status, you don't have to get the existing object to to know you know the other locations. You can just reconstruct that, and you get in fact all the locations, all the statuses of all the locations on the fly. So once again, it's there is no additional um, request to uh, that is required. Uh, to the KCP shard to be able to reconstruct the status. Go ahead, Antonin. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, that, that is awesome to have a solution to get rid of the leaves resources that gets created. Uh, I, I didn't get the, the part uh, from an external controller standpoint. How would you see 
to that logic to be delivered basically yeah so i mean i think it's mainly it depends on on the level your controller would work on if you're I mean, if if you have a controller that is only interested uh, by you know the the um, external kcp view the main kcp view then there is nothing changed if you have a controller that is interested uh, at leveraging the status of location specific views typically that's the ingress controller it gets the you know um, ips of every leaf ingress currently and then updates the an envoy uh, um, uh, configuration based on that and in such a case um the um one of the ideas would be to uh make available the logic that that allows you reconstructing location specific resources based on the diffs mainly the same uh, method that the same function that is used to reconstruct the locations uh, in the in the in the virtual workspace would be available as an api or you know as a helper for external uh, controllers so i mean the ingress controller would just get one ingress with all these you know uh, diffs and just would have to call one method that would return based on this object it would return a list of objects list list of resources which are per location in fact and and to, to, and, and for the the case so that is for uh, getting the status aggregating the statuses back uh, mm -hmm. from the and, and and for example if we had to write the deployment splitter as an external controller i how would you drive the logic to you know to split the replicas basically the myth, the method uh, that you what is you, it what does it mean when you say to write an external deployment controller right so like the sinker should be the kind of standard like, like, pattern are you saying i want to I want to define a custom deployment splitter that's very, very different from what most people would want, or am I trying to tweak the behavior? Like, what's the use case for the for this custom controller? Just to help me understand. Um, so I, I'm I'm thinking basically like the hybrid cup gateway, where it it won't. I mean, that would be a, an external controller running connected to a KCP um, service, basically. So the, I mean, you would have that controller want that um, to to want to perform a logic on the on the spec of the resources that get synced to the physical cluster. Right, but what resources? Because if you're if the hybrid cloud service, which is trying to fit, like it's what is the use case for the the object? What object you're talking about? Because if you're talking about deployment you're saying, oh, I'd run a different deployment splitter, but that would mean then you're conflicting with the sinker. Yeah, the sinker. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was, I mean, taking that that deployment splitter as an example, because it, it got, I mean, David yeah. uses it, but I mean, not, 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 not uh, um, I mean, just as an example, taking it out of, uh, I mean, um, KCP and run it externally. Uh, just as an example but yeah obviously we wouldn't have two one running in kcp by default i guess or, and and another one but just so that we understand how that mechanism could be applied for other resources yeah, or... yeah by the way uh, in 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 the kcp virtual i mean the sinker virtual workspace it would not be necessarily hard coded because it's mainly just you know pluggable transformations uh, that you can add per gbr so i mean it it would be something that could even be be configured. But what I, if I understand clearly your question? The question is that for now it's completely synchronous the transformation from the KCP object to the location specific object. And what if you want to plug some logic uh, that could be you know provided by a controller? Yeah. So I mean for the for the um, the downstream to upstream case the status consolidation it's a bit easier because you know it's the end of the flow yeah. so i mean even if you did nothing special if you updated all the diffs for per location then you can react after the fact in a controller in the ingress controller that's right that um for the for the down i mean upstream to downstream it's a bit trickier because it's really um 
you know, uh, a synchronous process. Uh, the transformation is done during lists and watches, for example. And so, if, obviously, we could delegate to some, you know, yeah. webhook-like or yeah. even to some controller, you know, a bit on the model of, of subject access review or stuff like that. But then the problem is that on the, on the asynchronous part, your controller, you would need to really be very fast because you are waited for by, by a process that is inherently synchronous. So that's the main, it's completely possible to delegate that to some other external component. The main challenge here is that you have to be very reactive because you have to answer in the context of a, of a yeah. synchronous. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking maybe that's completely irrelevant, but the annotation mm. that you, you use as a mechanism to, I mean, store that unstructured yeah diff to be able to reconstruct the different views sure. like could it be used also to drive the spec from the upstream to the downstream like yes an yeah exactly yes that that would i mean that would also be an option to do a bit like what i explained with the status that means that the same way uh, ingress controller would be able to you know have an api or a helper to decode the the the, the um the diffs Possibly, we could provide some sort of API to be able to produce the diffs yourself yeah, that'd be awesome. outside of the overall process. And then, in the in the main sinker loop, if the um, if those if they are already there, and maybe there is a flag or something like yeah. that, or dedicated I, I, we would not. Sorry, I need to break in here. Um, we've got about twenty minutes left. We want to talk about scoping for uh, zero point four. So um, I would encourage you all to continue this discussion offline, um, either separately or in a Google Doc or Slack or somewhere, if that's cool. All right, um, Jason, if you would, wouldn't would mind resuming screen sharing, uh, the last item is the P4 items in the work packages doc. Okay, so um, our target date is a month from today, April 29th. We had been hoping to have about a, a six weeks or so, a month and a half, uh, if we had finished prototype three on the 18th, but uh, it slipped a little bit. So looking at the schedule, or actually, let me start with themes, transparent multi-cluster workloads and repository, repository hygiene and approachability. So schedule-wise, we want to have designs and rough sketches for demos on April 4th, which I don't have my calendar in front of me, is Monday next week. We have our community call a week from today on the 5th, where we can review that. And then coding complete on the 22nd, community review on the 26th, and closing out the milestone at the end of April. So. Um, Stefan, can I turn it over to you, or <laughs> would you yeah. be willing to um, yeah. take over and talk about the focus here? So we have lots of top topics, I think. There's a strong focus, as the theme suggests, on TMC, Transparent Multi-Cluster. Um, there are topics, that's also commented, there are topics around, yeah, what the cursor is of your archive, so this multi-cluster workload thing, multiple clusters for one, uh, namespace, which probably depend on David's work. So David will continue this work. We will see when this lands, but if we decide this is this is a, the future, we should be very careful not to build new APIs or new splitters or something like that, which then have to move over to, to the virtual workspace. Um, yeah, we have to just to, to see which of those we want. I mean, the time and the number of people does not allow that we do all of that. Thing location is also a big thing we should implement. That's an API, which everybody talks about, but we haven't done uh, the actual work of adding that to the system. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of stuff here and I don't think there's any way we can do all of this unless we gain a lot of new contributors <laughs> who can realize yeah. very quickly. Um, yeah, so I, everybody should 
everybody should have something in mind where he sees his name in front or behind already, I think. Maybe that's a good start to, to think what is feasible in this time frame. So what I want to drive is this uh, thing, location thing, um, discussion, API, and maybe start with implementation. Could you really just remind what the, the next one is, implement discovery push from the sync back to KCP? I probably missed the, the corresponding doc. Sorry, what this was is, that? This is uh, in one, yeah, I can, I can link the doc. The link is, is there actually, if you open that, Oh, yeah. got it. I'm sorry. Basically, finishing the discovery part um, of the pull mode sinker. Mm, okay. Like we disconnect mm. KCP from the actual clusters. This is not possible anymore in the future. And mm. building everything around that the API, the sinker part. Okay. Step on for thing location. Is that the same thing as the location and placement API? Can we consolidate those two? Yeah, I guess this is probably the same thing. I'm not sure multi multi cluster scheduling, how far we get with that. So there are overlaps for sure. We can move it over. And we can scope that. I mean, we don't have to do it today, right? Um, but we have to do work there, API work. For the pod logs uh, item, are we comfortable with 0 0.4, including just in a design we all agree on for this? I feel like the implementation of this will be. Yeah, I, I, design oh. plus prototype. Some kind of. I don't, I don't think we commit on, on delivering that, right? That's what you say. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, I guess we need to check in with Antonio and see if he has availability. Yeah. Um, so we didn't talk about the first one, diagnosability when why syncing fails. But before we get into yeah. that, like I'm trying to figure out the approach here, given that there's so many things in here and a finite number of people. And like Stefan, you were talking about putting names next to items. Um, like, should we, should each of us put our our name next to one thing and plan for getting that one thing in, or what? Are you, what were you thinking? I think the goal for the moment is um, to start with patterns with people interested. And next week, Monday is basically the, the deadline for that. So put your names and meet those people and try to scope the topic for the time frame we have. Okay. So we don't necessarily need to get names on here right now during the call, but it needs to be done. If it happens today, tomorrow would be yeah. good. And yeah. start scheduling design sessions. So announce them in the Slack as usual um, and talk an hour about those topics. Sounds good. Are there any items in here that folks want to talk about specifically with the 10 to 15 minutes we have left? I love the Varsha's name by Client Cooling. We were talking about that one in Slack, and she was willing to pick that up and drag. OK. Um, I want to put my name in here as well, um, at least to help guide the direction. Yeah, and I'll be looking there, uh, too. I can add my name later, though. Thanks. Are there specific things uh, uh, for repo hygiene? I'm not, this is not intended to uh, say that I think we don't need repo hygiene, but like, are there issues tagged with hygiene or 
stuff specifically that we want to get done for that? Uh, one of them that comes to mind for me is creating a base controller that mm. all the controllers can extend. Uh, there's an issue mm. open for it. Um, you know, we're we're not using controller runtime. It's it's somewhat impossible right now, given the state of things. So without that, then the next best thing is to create a base controller. It's a topic about enabling kind end-to-end -end tests. It's also kind of hygiene related, like having real workload tests. At the moment, we fake everything in KCP itself. There's no pot running. Yeah, maybe it's also related to the fact that uh, we would remove demos uh, if we remove, you know, the the demo scripts uh, having end-to-end tests, end-to-end tests with, you know. Complete real um, mode is quite important, I assume. Oh, sorry, Andy. What was that uh, you said about the controller runtime? Oh, just that, like we're not importing controller runtime in KCP and using it. So, we, oh yeah, we need a base controller so that people don't have to copy and paste two hundred lines of code to get a controller working. Makes sense. Makes sense. Should we discuss the namespace targeting bullets that are on there? I think, Jason, you have the most context on that. You're talking about the two I've highlighted right now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, these are probably fairly small to medium-sized things, like just allowing incoming requests to specify things and, and not have them be overwritten by us, by our own decisions. Is there a concept about security here? This sounds dangerous. Uh, yeah, this would definitely not be something we would recommend in general, but some of the downstream users want to test with this, is my understanding, or... or uh, so I could, or I could easily see some, yeah. yeah, I could see some experimental annotation, which has this experimental word in the name. Yeah. Go for it. Um, I don't... I, I don't think it's a long-term... Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's not something we want long term. It's it's only to be able to enable short term uh, experimentation. So yeah, it's, uh, uh, experimental .kcp .dev slash don't do this slash whatever. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Uh, but it, it, those two things are important for some downstream uh, stuff. So we will want to get those done in P four. Um, um, right here. Yeah. I had my sorry. I put my comment into the chat. I'm just wondering if the um, ability to schedule the removal of workloads is, probably comes underneath the location placement work. It's tightly aligned with that. Probably. Stefan, uh, are you cool moving that? Is it unscheduling or which one? Yeah, removing workloads. Yeah, move it to the location topic. We have to talk about that. It's not a commitment yet, but I mean, yeah, we have to get better in scheduling. At the moment, this is really demo-like, and we can talk about that at least and okay. solve it. Uh, Maru, you were starting to say something. Is it those two? Um namespace related ones it's probably something david should have a look at because it's likely that you could incorporate support directly into virtual workspaces rather than have the sync or worry about it yeah maybe i think there's still there's still a need for how the user expresses that when they create the object how it how it gets piped onto the sinker yeah it might might be tbd but we have to have some control for them to switch first. Yeah, and by the way, um, related to virtual thinkers, um, I think we, we should have discussions in, you know, the various workload related and thinker related stuff. We should have discussions about what should be put and transformed as, as for transformations. 
what should be put back into the virtual sinker transformations and what should be transformed on the you know sinker client side on, on the physical cluster maybe everything should be moved back to the virtual sinker but that's not you know sold I'm not sure i think we have we have to discuss that for example, you know, service account uh, switching and stuff like that. We we have to to weigh uh, every use case and 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 know if it's if it has to be done on the virtual workspace side or not. I think the only part that needs to be done on the sinker side is retaining fields of the the workload cluster. But in terms of like getting to the form that we want to see on the workload cluster, that could be something. Is the sole responsibility of the virtual workspace. Mm -hmm. This is almost certainly very off topic, but how would a sinker say that there is not capacity for the replicas it is assigned by the virtual workspace? Is that something we need the sinker to make a decision on and push back up? Isn't it the responsibility of the scheduler? I mean, the scheduler uh, being notified in some way uh, from of, yeah. of the of, of the workload and then the scheduler can you know add annotation and stuff like that that would drive the the, the way the sinker does um its transformations yeah i guess yeah it would just look like the sinker saying you you told me to schedule seven things and i can only schedule three of them yeah. and then the scheduler exactly. picks that up and rebalances okay seems to so, me that we have totally to, yeah. to more clearly draw the lines between scheduling syncing uh, quite systematic syncing but with strategies and then the sinker uh, client side which is completely blind yeah sounds good marie you've been helping us get our testing strategy and, and just general kind of code pipeline in shape in, in prototype three is there anything in 0 0.4 that you want to call out on the hygiene side not so much on the hygiene side um and there's a tension between you know getting features done and getting nice to have development stuff but ideally we, we would move all the controllers into a single controller manager and enable um debugging controllers individually in tests um i'm not sure of the timeline on that but that's definitely sort of the next big task All right, cool. If we, if we got a link to a, an issue, or if you want to write one up and link it in here, that'd be perfect. Sure. Stefan, before we close out, do you want to reiterate what the expectations are? I think I heard design meetings in the next three days, and then yeah, please start those design meetings. One hour, half an hour meetings, whatever. Invite the people in Slack, um, so make it public, if possible and try to scope it down for the time we have. This must be pretty aggressive for, for a lot of topics here. So we want to know basically next week um, how a demo will roughly look like. And um, we should be ready to also assign blocker labels to those topics here, which we think fits and which we think are important. So prepare for that and yeah, that's a task for until Monday, of course. Paul, can you create a demo document again and share it so people yep. can add their topics? Thanks. Will do. Yeah. Um. I think now we're probably at a pretty good stopping point. Uh, just to reiterate, if you are um, putting your name next to something in this list, please start uh, working on designs and scheduling meetings to discuss. And the goal is to come back on Monday, Tuesday next week and be able to have them roughly finalized uh, so that we have our final scope for 0 0.4 locked in. All right, thanks everybody. This was a great meeting today. I appreciated the demo from David and all the discussion. So thanks again and see you all online and next week.
Thanks, everyone. See you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.